we're moving on to an area which I would assume as a layperson is one of the areas of most likely threat, that being the banking and financial sector. And uh, we have a panel of experts in the area. If you would please welcome from Fexco, we have Richard Harper, from AIB, Gary Delaney, from FBD, Enda Kine, and from IBM, Alan Jenkins. And I'll start by challenging that um, assumption. Um, um, Richard, maybe you'd have a view on, on this. Is that accurate that it's a particular area of threat? Yeah, I think um, financial services is, has the, um, the benefit that it affects all of us. Um, so there, there is a lot of awareness around um, people's bank accounts and their personal finances. So people might be more sensitive to uh, being notified of, of issues with, with uh, their bank account and so on. But still we see that, that people, even with that highlighted awareness, are still falling victim to what, what has been uh, around for years of phishing attacks and bank account um, emails that come in asking them to give them their online banking pen numbers and things like and that. And people still do that? Absolutely. It's still... It's still um, a proven method for people to, to, to get caught into phishing attacks and so on. Um, th there has been a lot of awareness from, in fairness, to financial organizations to, to, to raise um, training and awareness for in customers, um, but still it is one of the most lucrative areas in terms well, of... Well, it's funny, you see it, Gary, in all of your branches. You see the thing saying, we will never get in touch with you directly. It'll, uh, uh, any email in that nature is phishing. Is most of what you perceive the threats to be threats to your customers using your brand or threats or attacks on the institution itself? Well, the threats or attacks go against the institution, but obviously to target the, the endpoint. So why is a bank a nice target? It has money in it. Like you're getting to basically the, the core thing that every cyber criminal wants to get to. Sometimes they steal data, sometimes they steal cards, sometimes they steal any sort of information, they try to monetize it. That's a multiple step process. In a bank, you can actually get great, straight to the money. So it's an attractive target from that perspective. How are they gonna do that? They're gonna do that by going to the least um, defended area, which usually is people, both inside and outside. So if you take the customer view, people, people will protect and look to protect their own assets, their own value, their own, um, their own money, essentially. But they also look to the institution to protect you. So if you wake up tomorrow morning and find your bank account is empty, you pick up the phone and ring the bank and say, my money's gone, what are you going to do about it? And it's a pretty reasonable ask because the bank is there to protect the money in the way it was in a traditional banking scenario where you had a big safe, they locked the money in, you had a ledger and money was transacted this way. So that's the challenge that a bank has. However, the world is different than that world. The, access to the information, the access to the banking channel, the ability to transact is all out there in the world. And the behaviors that people manifest in order to do that type of activity are totally within their own control. So if they don't keep credentials secure, or they respond to that email, or, or they're not aware that the, a pause terminal might be fake, or there might be a, a card reader on an ATM machine, then they're very vulnerable. So the only thing banks can do in that regard is, yes, try and educate and do greater awareness so that customers understand the risks, but also then on, on the bank side, try to monitor for it. But why have we not seen big online bank robberies? Why have we not seen tiger kidnappings aimed ultimately at a cyber robbery rather than at a physical robbery? Or does that happen and banks just don't talk about it? Um, you don't have to go to that degree to extract the value. What's a cyber crime? It's a low risk crime relative to walking into a bank with a gun. You walk into a bank with a gun, you might extract money in the hundreds of thousands of euros, potentially, whatever. You can extract millions from a bank through a low risk approach. For example, last year, the SWIFT system, which is the interbank payment instruction system, was, was hacked, essentially, at the Central Bank of Bangladesh. They extracted $81 million. Only for a spelling mistake, it would have been $1 billion. And it was relatively unsophisticated insofar as, yes, the attack was a sophisticated attack, but it had been done before. It had been done before, and they went after an institution that they felt had a low threshold to protect themselves, and it's a central bank, so it deals in tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars on a daily basis, on a transaction basis. So why take the risk of something like a, 
you know, a physical threat when you can actually just extract the money And that directly. could have been a billion dollar uh, robbery. Ab absolutely. A spelling mistake in, in the instruction, because SWIFT is just an instruction to tell the bank to transfer money from one account to another. It's not the transfer of the money itself. There was a, um, it was written in English and there was a misspelling in, in, in the text and somebody in, I think it was Deutsche Bank, noticed it and said, mm, I better check this. And they found it was a fraudulent instruction. And it was a live human being who spotted it rather than a system, was yeah, it? Yeah, a live human being, because what happens to the, often to these messages is if there's an anomaly, they drop into a queue that a human being reviews. And that's how they Let's widen it. it beyond banking. The end of the threat in terms of uh, insurance. It's actually, it's more insurance fraud, actually, rather than, than cyber. Um, we very much, anybody coming after us is either coming after us ransomware at the moment via email is probably the predominant one, or somebody trying to hack in, in via data. Uh, ironically, most insurance companies are still quite manual in that some still use, use paper and would key data enter uh, in back office systems, or we're basically using trusted devices. I'm amazed. I would have thought the insurance company had such a legacy in, in actuarial analysis and big data that you would have raced to go to computer well, 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 actually, legacy is the term. Most insurance companies have uh, systems greater than 30 years old and they're putting digital layers on top of it. With an FBD, we've invested heavily in the last couple of years of going on to a new modern system, and that's actually allowing the business to interact direct with the customer and get straight through processing and, and allow the web. But actually, it's still a bit of a fortress in terms of business process. So it means that um, we don't necessarily have people coming at us through an online banking type scenario. It really is social engineering. Um, we have a very, very strict email uh, screening system. So as against previous jobs where we are preventing email getting out to end users, we don't get a complaint. Do you understand that if email is blocked for the smallest thing and it's checked, there's a reason for it? Because we're very compliance and regularly heavy. Sometimes maybe a bit of fatigue about the amount of it, but, but people are used to it and are used to checks and balances. Um, and we have a very, very locked down private network in terms of how our business works. And it's still very face-to-face -face. for us in NFPD. We've and is that due to security conservatism, or is that just a legacy of the way the business is like, It's Insurance has always been quite a conservative business. And uh, it's still based on other than consumer car and policy. Uh, anything above that that has any complexity is still people talking to people. So the business is transacted person to person, and either we have a, a sales representative or we've got a specialist on the road basically keying in the policy and through a laptop that's a dedicated device and have to use what we call two-factor authentication, they have to use a password on the phone. Everything else tends to be documented and keyed in, in the back office. And would you regard insurance, banking, financial services on, in the broader sense as at the vanguard of cybersecurity, do, do you regard that as part of the industry, or are you just the same as everybody else? Um, no, it's, it's certainly, um, um, I, I, um, last couple of years I was involved in higher education uh, in the medical space, and we were getting hit constantly with very, very significant uh, hacking threats, much more so than financial services. And the reason being that financial services are used to investing in the fortress mentality, they're used to shutting down access to C drives and machines, not allowing you to access personal email while at work, uh, even cutting out paper and, and being able to print in sensitive business areas. So it's ingrained in the business. Um, so hackers are going more after the easier targets who are to see a more lenient business environment. Um, and in the case we were, it was, it was, uh, was higher education. And you know, I was one of the customers brought in um, smart tech and 24-7 uh, uh, um, instant response and also brought in, in in Watson because what we did basically was anything that looked suspicious, we shut the device down immediately or we shut the server down immediately. We taught people how to become doctors. So shutting down devices didn't make a big issue. But it was all response time. It was in five to 10 minutes, we just kill the thing because our users have had a huge amount of leniency in terms of what they could surf for and what they could click on. And a lot of it was educating that whole CXO line that we're, we are going to be hit, it's, it's, a, it's a certainty, demonstrating return on investment that we are being hit, but here's how we contained it, here's how we dealt with it, here's the metrics. And that really transformed their understanding of how we actually approach cybersecurity. But definitely in the financial services, a really good industry to demonstrate upfront investment, in my view. In, in you mentioned things. Watson. Alan, from an IBM perspective, banking and financial services in terms of, of cyber security, how does it rate internationally compared to other industries and how well protected is it against cyber threats? 
So it's one of the more mature sectors from a cybersecurity angle. I think as three previous speakers have all indicated in terms of investment going back some years. That's both a good thing and, and I think actually causes us some issues as well because the legacy adds complexity and complexity tends to kill us. That's pretty much common across all geographies. Uh, but there's very much a maturity difference and I think we kind of see that between banking and insurance as uh, Edna was just describing in terms of the banks are perhaps more mature, but their risk profile is higher because there's money involved. Uh, insurance, very much data rich, particularly when we get into personal identifiable and sensitive area. And when it comes to an extortion attack, that might be what a criminal goes after. Uh, to, and that brings you kind of to motivation. So it's difficult to look at FSS as a singleton. Um, and whether it's as effective in its response is is, a, is probably an open debate question, because I think that varies. We, and we've seen some real life examples over the last 12 to 18 months where the, where the response side has indicated that actually there is a resiliency issue, that the detection is still too slow, that the prevention is not, um, is not harmonious, is, is not consistent across an enterprise, uh, and then the response can vary quite greatly. So Presumably as well, there is a set of challenges. I mean, Gary, you might have a view on this. There's a set of challenges in the, in the pure banking industry that are at the higher level for an organization in terms of Internet of Things, whether it be ATMs or contactless payment, in terms of the multiple user logins that you have, in terms of mobile user logins, you have a very fast growing series of devices and different access points across a very broad network. Absolutely. I mean, that's been the growth of financial technology in the last few years and, and everybody in 2017 wants everything in their pocket or available immediately or on Alexa, on Amazon to talk to their bank account and they want to be able to interact as they want to interact. Um, it's even going to expand. I mean, PSD2, Payment Services Directive, is going to bring in regulation that requires financial institutions to open up their systems to third parties to transact on your behalf. So. The principle being it's your money, your data, your relationship, but I want to use, say, for example, something like Sage as an accounting software directly into my bank account so I can manage it directly rather than have the sort of by proxy model that we have today. Now, that's the regulator um, instituting that change, not the banking industry trying to drive a new innovation. Um, it's a great opportunity for the financial services industry, but it's also a whole new attack vector, a whole new set of challenges that the financial services industry is going to have to grapple with. And this stuff is going to, just going to keep going on and on and on because um, the customer is king in this regard. The customer drives the requirements for innovation in, in the banking industry. And where the banking industry doesn't respond to it, uh, disruptors come into the market and you have inventions like Apple Pay and things like that that people like and they want to use and if the bank doesn't provide it to them, they'll use Apple. I mean, to, to most people born in the internet era, they don't think about a bank as a bricks and mortar safe institution to look after my money and my financial well-being. They just see it as another business to offer a set of services. But if Apple or Google or somebody else provides a better service as they see it, they'll just use them. So I do, I do t agree there that the financial services sector is, is facing more challenges than other sectors in terms of the, the regulatory side, in terms of the, the user take-up, the disruptors, as, as you mentioned. Um, disruptors don't have any of the mature or legacy infrastructure to protect, it's very easy for them to get up and running and um, very often they don't have the, the onerous regulatory obligations that the more established players have. But also then there is the complexity of established organisations um, in terms of um, their supply chain. And uh, I know in, in the US there's, there's, there's a large emphasis on securing the supply chain and the due diligence on vendors. Uh, more so than we have in Europe at the moment, I think. Uh, but again, the, the organisations that are delivering these, these new innovative products are able to move faster and every, every established financial services institution is now investing in these products and they need to do so in a secure manner but also protect the brand and the reputation of the established uh, institution. So, and what, so about that's the, a new the, what about the human that. risk, Richard? The, 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 the insider, the either poor practice or malign practice from within the organization, is that sufficient to shield it against? Yeah, the, the insider risk is very real. You, you asked earlier, Anton, about you know, 
robbing the bank. You know, criminals don't rob banks in cyber, the cyber world anymore. They get the employees to rob the banks with things such as invoice redirection, you know, or, or something called business email compromise, which people will know about. So the bank uh, may not be involved in this bank robbery. It's just really just one large organization paying a fraudulent invoice or, or transferring money fraudulently. The bank is just a repository of the money in, in that regard. Um, so it's, it's very easy for, for um, people, again, the, the, the insider threat, which is not malicious in this case, accidental, but um, uh, the malicious threat also exists um, there. And that's, this is where various things like um, training and monitoring and um, even things like whistleblowing uh, legislation can, can, can uh, help in terms of um, ensuring that information, if, if there is something suspicious going on, that it's known. Um, Does the training work? <laughs> you asking me? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't, I mean, it always came back to the three E's. So you educate, you engineer, you enforce. And they are cyclical constantly. But give an example, right? So if we take, uh, as, and picking up on the team, uh, just as well, uh, around uh, insider side, I mean, in financial services, end user computing or spreadsheets are a real pain to try and lock down. So there's, there's a whole thing if you're SOX compliant or issues, uh, and uh, a lot of the issues really come out of somebody having sensitive data that gets into a spreadsheet, may or may not be password protected, it's emailed, right? Call a spade a spade. Um, and I often joke, I nearly had to go to therapy to say that governance is my, fr <laughs> governance is my friend, being an IT person. So how do you lock stuff down? So I own GDPR and I own IT security and FBD. So basically, we create new policy um, that dictates what should be in a spreadsheet and why. Um, and we enforce that. And we actually use our internal and external audit colleagues to enforce policy, because nothing frightens a finance person more, including the folks downstairs, than one of their own calling call them out. Right? So there are tools internally that help reinforce that. And then when you look at why, why do colleagues take information out of a system and putting into end user computing, well, there's a bit of a power thing. There's a bit of a thing that says, well, the system can't do my job. I, I, I'm really powerful and I know that. Now, ironically, in some organizations, in, including banks, they may regard that individual as an enterprise risk because of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is, and, and certainly picking up a, a, a point that Brian Padden made earlier on, IT is coming more and more to the fore. Because in reality, I think, an insurance company, we're becoming a technology company that sells insurance. Banks are a technology company that sells money. IT is coming back more and more saying, we have to change the ways of working and people's understanding of the impact or the outcome of not doing something properly. And is that recognized and accepted at sea level and at board level? Um, it's recognized but not accepted. So uh, I sit at sea level, in fairness, in, in, in FBD, and I have a very good remit. It's, high, it's highly governed. But certainly, uh, colleagues in underwriting, sales, and finance don't appreciate when either I myself or a member, a colleague on my team, sticks their oar in and says, you're going to change your business process. Um, so it's part of it is winning hearts and minds. Uh, part of it is, is trying to simplify the impact of a cyber-related issue on the business. So they can understand a solvency uh, or a Basel issue, for instance. They can understand uh, IFRS accounting issues. But the glaze over very quickly when it comes to technology, and you really have to invest in storytelling or sometimes slightly shock tactics. Yeah. And when you get to the board, it's even tougher because they're just, they don't understand the terminology and they don't want to understand it. Hank and Tom are available for rent anytime you need to terrify yeah, yeah, your yeah. board. On that note, and what about resilience? How, how, how well built in is resilience into the financial services sector and companies? Arguably more so than other industries, but then there's been some spectacular failures that show that that's not a, a universal truth. But if I can just pick up on Gary's point there around when it comes to tackling the board, they're not going to talk our language. We have to talk theirs. So we've absolutely got to get into the language of the entrepreneur, which is probably what most of the board are. They, they think of themselves in that mindset. So we've got to talk the value. We've got to talk the value case of what we're doing. That's a downside, and that's where the shock comes in. But it, you've got to talk about an upside as well, and that tends to be reputation protection, the advantages of doing things. Now, we start to get into some slightly dangerous ground here because we start to use security as a differentiator between competitors, and we're trying to encourage collaboration within the industries. 
But I've started to see, certainly on the mainland, security being used in advertising campaigns by the banks. Uh, and I can think of two in particular. One, um, one building society and one tier one bank have both used security within their messaging within the last two months. And that's a sea change. If that's currently happening in the UK, do you expect it to cross the Irish Sea to here, Gary? Well, that's the consumer side of it. So absolutely, because you know when we're talking about the people side of security, which is a critical, shall we say, uh, challenge for any institution, but particularly a bank. And um, there's a lot of people out there as well. The customers actually have a part to play, and if we can influence them to play um, the right way, then it will overall increase our resiliency. But the other side of it is to touch on the point about cooperation. Um, it's a non-competitive space if you're in the financial services center or uh, industry, or it should be. Um, so institutions need to cooperate with respect to the, the major threats that are out there. They need to be sharing information, and not just in the sense of a monthly meeting where all the stuff that happens sort of gets reviewed. It's actually about establishing the networks, establishing the relationships between the institutions, getting to know each other in the Why sense. Why get all pally in relation to security if competition drives every other facet of the business? Because there's no competitive advantage, really, in terms of an institution getting... So if, one, if our largest rival suffers a major cyber attack, it actually hurts us as well. It does. It hurts the entire industry. At the very least, it'll have us running around for two or three weeks seeing if it's going to happen to us or if it, the same thing is occurring at the same time. Uh, it affects the financial services industry across the country. It affects the economy, potentially. It's a space whereby cooperation makes sense because if something happens to your rival and they alert you to the fact and you're able to plug that gap, overall resiliency of that economy or that industry uh, goes up. I get the sense you agree with that, Enda. Yeah, the central bank actually, it's a formal ask back to everybody uh, within financial services to actually collaborate, share information, share ways of working, share understanding of outcomes. Because despite all the tools, and in my view is, we've got loads of things that will tell us where we are right now, what has happened retrospectively. But we still have a lot of work to do. It's still a lot of manual intervention. It's still a lot of enforcing rules. And the more we share, the more intelligence, because there's a shortage of really good security people in the industry. Um, we're very reliant on good third parties to work with. So sharing that actually helps pre prevent an embarrassment at the end. But it's a formal ask from CBI, from Central Bank. Gotcha. To share. All right. Let's see if there's a couple of questions, folks. Anybody who has a query, if you throw a hand in the air. My God, we may have covered everything. All right, Go on, just one. They want my coffee. See, this is the problem. You put caffeine versus further information neck and neck. There's one. Okay, there's two. They, that'll, that'll complete us. We'll go one back here to the gentleman in the uh, waistcoat, just on grounds of nattiness. It's so rare you see a type in these days. And then we'll head down here. Yes, sir. I'm just wondering, um, something you touched on, on Antoine earlier in relation to kind of insider trading. Um, we mentioned the idea of phishing emails or piece of malware to a link, but the idea of where the employee is deliberately clicking the link and is in agreement with the person that's sending through that piece of malware or that phishing email. Have we seen examples of that? For instance, the guy in Bangladesh who could have ignored the one mistake that was there and rather than you know that being stopped, it would have been... 81 or what is it, 80 billion or whatever it was. So I'm just wondering, is there any examples of that, especially in the banking industry where there's access to so much finance and so much money? Interesting question. Well, Complicit. There's always examples of insiders being placed in companies or institutions to commit crimes. But I think that's the same as it's always been. With, with respect to the cyber stuff, particularly sending malware in, phishing, that type of thing, it's a multiple step process. They send it in to get it into the environment so that then they can use it to exploit something else, i.e. send a message or um, you know, harvest credentials or do something else. They may then activate an internal in order to be able to extract the value or not, but it's a multi-step process rather than simply sending something into an individual so they can release it on the network. It's probably too simplistic. Um, I wouldn't say it's any, from my own experience in banks that I've worked in, any greater level of risk today than it potentially has been before, Having qualified that, though, in the sense of the systems are available to people to do more with them. So if you wish to put an insider in and extract value, and that person had a level of privilege, they probably have an easier job of doing it today than maybe they did 20 years ago. Gary, I just want, I want you to give me credit for not asking all the supplementary questions about how would one go about that, and because the urge to ask criminal <laughs> questions is overwhelming. Okay, let's get the final question for here, if we could. 
Sorry, uh, just in relation to the digital single market, have you any kind of priorities or plans? Because GDPR is coming in 2018, but ultimately it's heading towards what they call the digital single market. And I mean, you're at the, the forefront of the fueling of that. Question, would you, would you have any kind of priorities or plans or well, any we, thoughts? We're doing, it's a regulation. You know, there's a lot of planning and there's a lot of work going around it. There's a lot of implications to be understood. It's early days with these things. And a lot of responsibilities are putting, put on banks with respect to managing data, but it actually applies to everybody in the sense of if you've got data, some people's data, it's treated as their data, but you're a custodian of it. You must protect it and you must use it in responsible ways and you must use it with the owner's permission. I'm sure it's the same in... Enda, final word? Yeah, just in, on the insurance side, an interesting corollary. In, in banking, you, you, you're, you're observing behaviour over time based on transactions. In insurance, it's a point in time and it's priced as a risk. So if you're a, a male of a certain age, certain demographic, and customers now want personalised quotes that are saying, well, do they not know I leave my car at the train station, I don't drive? Well, how do we know that? So, so there's a huge leap with GDPR coming in the insurance industry that says, well... How, how do I receive that piece of information about you as a person? What control points over the year do I get to actually check that that's happened because that's what I'm pricing? And how do I guard that? Because that data is really sensitive. So it, to, a, to a lay person not involved in, in something like pricing risk where it's a one-see-year phone call, it gets really tricky, but it is a potential leapfrog when we get it's there. sensitive, but it's also useful, isn't it? Because it allows you to do a whole series of more subtle calculations than you might otherwise do if you have that layers of data. Well, you could do, but I wouldn't like it in my car. I pay a ferocious premium because I'm always driving fast and I'm on the phone <laughs> half the time. So, you know, when you take stuff like, when you take stuff like that, and, and I mean, simple things about telematics and that is, uh, just because you brake hard doesn't mean you're a bad driver. It could mean the driver in front of you is a bad driver. There's loads of things coming out that are not just straightforward, but for, where people want, it's the same in healthcare, if you want personalised medicine, you have to give something about yourself constantly to the, to, the, to the machine so that it can help price things and do things for you. And that's a huge change in what we call digital marketplace. Folks, we are overdue a coffee. Will you give a big round of applause, please, to Richard, to Enda, to Gary, and to Alan. Off the hook, guys. Thank you very much.